Um, this webinar is being recorded and it shall be made available on the PSU website. At the end of the webinar, you'll be prompted to fill a feedback form. Please, I request you to fill that feedback form. That's the only way we'll um, improve this webinar series. So please make time and, and fill that feedback form. Next slide, please. So um, what, has, what, what has been the PSU response towards the pandemic? Uh, so when um, you know, the first COVID-19, you know, um, WH was first notified about you know, uh, coronavirus at the end of December, um, I mean, December last year, uh, towards that, I mean, after that, the, the virus started spreading around the world and pharmaceutical side Uganda found it necessary to create a task force that will, you know, take leadership in providing guidance uh, to pharmacists uh, on coronavirus. So we have a COVID task force that is providing leadership on the PSU response. As you're aware, we're also producing alcohol-based hand wraps that we are selling at subsidized cost. We have also donate, do, donated worth 10 million uh, hand sanitizers to the Ministry of Health. Um, we're also doing a lot of media engagements. Um, you'll probably seen our secretary, Dr. Samuel Opio, making a lot of media appearance and also a lot of articles on the newspapers. Uh, we are also, we recognize that it's important to celebrate pharmacies that are on the front line. A lot of times you will hear is that doctors and the nurses that are getting the recognition, but we are aware that pharmacies are on the front line. Pharmacies are the first point of contact for the general public. So even in the community pharmacy during the lockdown, pharmacies will remain open and pharmacies are putting themselves on the front line and ensuring that you know, there's minimal disruptions in the medicine supply chain and the most vulnerable of the population continue to receiving that medicine. So if you follow the PSU social media pages, you will probably seen us profiling a number of pharmacists that are you know, working on the front line from you know, the hospitals um, to national medical store, you know, to the community pharmacies. So we do recognize that. Uh, also the task force is working on a number of guidelines to assist pharmacists um, in mitigating the risks due to this pandemic. Of course, the other thing we're doing is this webinar series that we started today. So we'll be having a number of webinar series in the next weeks or so. Uh, we'll tackle, you know, we'll bring some of the pharmacies on the front line to speak to us. We'll also hear from the means of health later. And then the you know, the, the pandemic has brought what we now call a new normal. So we're we'll discussing some of those new normal that you know, the pharmacy profession will have to adapt. It could be, you know, telepharmacy has now become more prominent because of the pandemic. So I'll, our you know, next webinar series will discuss some of those issues. And then we'll also try to bring someone from the means of health. Um, guys, my apologies. Yes, severe pneumonia of unknown origin. Most hard name this time. Yes, please. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> the first of uh, December 2019, WHO was notified. Hello. Hello. Um, yes. Uh Joshua, you can go ahead. Hello. Sorry, I got a, a bit of a problem. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So as I said before, we are progressing. So on the seventh uh, of uh, January, twenty twenty, we had uh, the, the agent, um, the, the the virus identified from the throat uh, swab samples that were conducted by the CDC uh, and uh, CDC DC, which is the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, and this was named uh, uh, the novel, P19 novel coronavirus. Uh, on the 30th of the same month, January, there was the first case in the US reported. And then of course the WHO uh, declared a public health emergency um, due to the coronavirus. Seventh of uh, February, 2020.
promising COVID-19 drug therapies and vaccines under trial. Now, what do we know about COVID-19? It's a novel, uh, novel pneumonia uh, outbreak identified in late December 2019 in Wuhan, China. Uh, the evidence of the virus mutant abilities based on uh, the NSP14, which is a non-structural protein at position 14, called the exoral nucleus uh, encoded proteins, is still evolving, or its role in the virus mutation is still evolving currently. We also uh, know that uh, potentially this is uh, this is potentially a more devastating public health emergency ever since the SARS in 2003, which cost the world close to 50 billion dollars, or the MERS in the early 2012, which cost up to 8 billion dollars. So this has, uh, as of now, the World Project, the, the, um, the World Economic Forum projects uh, to have cost uh, about um, 8 billion US dollars currently, and even more. So we also know that this has a low mortality rate, approximately two to five percent, high trans uh, transmissibility or infectivity compared to previous SARS uh, outbreaks, that is of SARS, uh, COV-1 and the MERS. The viral RNA so far has been detected in GI, that is the gastrointestinal tract, conjunctival and the respiratory secretions of COVID-19 positive patients. However, some people um, are still uh, giving more evidence of other detections at other sites of the body, uh, but that is subject to publication and strong evidence. The incubation period for this virus is about two to four days, and uh, with a median mortality age of 65 years. Now we have to bear in mind that this is actually depending on the different settings in China, that was 65 years, and in other countries, it is a bit even getting low. Some studies report up to 40 years, okay? Uh, and also there is viral shading following recovery. However, this has not been known how it plays a role in the pathogenesis of the disease. Newer emerging pathophysiological characteristics uh, of the disease um, recently include pulmonary thrombosis uh, with the diffuse intra uh, intravenous coagulations, and those are based on studies from China. I mean, from Italy. Uh, however, there is no reliable evidence of acquired immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And therefore, uh, different health models predict possibly there may be a second wave. However, that is subject to other findings which are ongoing. So what about the virus? So we have uh, mainly two parts of the viral genome that play a role in uh, the, uh, the proteins that are required for the viral replication and infectivity. And this is right coded as all of our reading from uh, the, 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 the open reading framework 1A and the open reading framework 1B, which encode specific proteins responsible for the viral um, uh, attack on the immune system, on the, on the body system. And uh, as we can see, there are some key genes, for example, the papain, uh, papain lake uh, protease uh, gene, which is at position three, and we have uh, the 3LC Pro, uh, 3CL Pro, which is at position five. We also have the RNA dependent RNA polymerase at position 12. We have the helicase uh, proteins encoded from position 13, and we have the exoribonuclease encoded from the position 14. And these are key proteins that are important later, as we shall discuss. Uh, while we try to determine what drugs are effective for this uh, virus or can cure the virus. So like we said before, the naming was uh, by CDC, uh, 2019 novel coronavirus, the WHO named it the COVID-19, and then the ICTV SARS-CoV-2. We also know that, that this virus is a uh, positive sense single-stranded RNA with about 87% homology to the bad uh, coronavirus in terms of the molecular sequence and also about 79%, you know, of uh, the SARS, the previous SARS outbreak, and only 52% for the mass. So it is much more closer to the bad cough, um, uh, which was uh, the, uh, what we are actually speculating as being the source, what has been confirmed. And then uh, in terms of the previous outbreaks, we can see that SARS, the, fi the first SARS outbreak in 2002, is much more closer in, uh, in sequence to this new outbreak. Uh, we also know that this virus has a strong affinity, about tenfold to the SE2, uh, SE2 angiotensin converting enzyme 2 than the SARS-CoV, the first outbreak. Um, 
the incubation period, like we said before, is two to 14 days, averagely five days. That is why we, that is what dictates the quarantine uh, period, you know, and the testing that is done subsequently to either rule out the presence of the virus or to um, give, or to give the, um, or to give the, uh, uh, determine when should the patient be discharged upon testing. On the diagnostic part, we are using reverse transcript tests a PCR technique, which is more of a DNA test. Uh, we just get the viral genome and then we transcribe it back into DNA. And then we want to uh, detect it using different techniques, which we shall see uh, up front. However, this has only up to uh, a maximum 80% sensitivity. And this is why some people are still, uh, are still pursuing the route of uh, seeing if they can uh, develop uh, serological tests. That includes the test using antibodies based on either immunity or the presence of the virus, which are more highly sensitive. Uh, also in diagnosis, uh, the importance is to have other auxiliary diagnostic uh, techniques, for example, the chest CT scan, which tend to be more sensitive compared to the uh, reverse transcript PCR uh, technique currently available worldwide. So we hope the two come in hand. Now, this is mainly a low respiratory tract infection affecting the type two alveolar cells, what we call the pneumocytes. Okay. So <clears throat> the main um, parts or components of the virus, we have the nucleocaspid. These are proteins that are encoded from the above um, uh, open reading framework 1A and uh, 1B. We have the nucleocaspid, we have the membrane, we have the spike protein, envelope protein. And then in it, we have the viral RNA genome, which is a positive sense. So um, what are some of the epidemiological comparisons of the last respiratory viral infections in the last um, two decades since the early 2000s? So I decided to include flu in this table so that we can compare how it's doing so far with the previous two outbreaks and then we compare to COVID-19. So we know very well uh, the causative agents in flu was the influenza. Uh, subtype A H and H one N one virus, and then we have COVID nineteen, which we are handling currently. Then we have the SARS CoV, and we have the MERS uh, virus. This came at a different timeline. So the first one here was the uh, the, 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 the SARS, which was two thousand two thousand three. Then we have the flu, the swine flu, which is about two thousand nine two thousand ten. Then we have the MERS, which was two twelve two thirteen, and now the COVID nineteen in twenty nineteen. Now, the case fatality rate, uh, most interestingly, is that uh, MERS had the highest case fatality rate. That means more people died out of the infection compared to any other infection till now, even with coronavirus. When you look at the incubation period, it is averagely the same, averagely the same, although flu had a shorter incubation period. That means you can detect uh, the virus symptomatically and manage and uh, compare it to the COVID-19. How many uh, patients were hospitalized or the hospitalization rate? We can see that uh, the highest hospitalization is in COVID-19, and we shall explain why. Um, with the previous uh, coronavirus infections, we have had mass having about 4 to 13%, and most of the case was due to acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then we have SARS, which was having 10 to 60%, um, uh, mostly because of pneumonia, okay? So the global infection, flu has uh, up to now, they are or recently WHO reviewed it is, uh, its records and they realized up to about 1 billion people, even plus up to 1.4 billion they reported were affected with the flu uh, virus. However, with COVID-19, so far we have seen we're at 3.4 million and we're still counting. The SARS up to 2003, by 2003, we had about 8,400 and 39 infections, okay? Um, which, which cities were the first that we had to detect the virus from? So in flu, it was in Mexico where it began from. It is Wuhan currently where we, ex uh, where we know that the COVID-19 began. And then still in China where we had the SARS, the first SARS outbreak, and uh, Saudi Arabia is where we had the mass outbreak from. So, the pathogenesis of the virus. Now, it's important to know that this pathogenesis is not based on uh, the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 itself, but with modeling studies and knowing that uh, it is much more related to the previous SARS outbreaks, this is what has been concluded so far. So 
we have someone through sneezing or by touch or by another means we have uptake of uh, aerosolized uptake of SARS-CoV-2 the virus which leads to infection of SCE2 expressing target cells these are the numerous cells like as before in the lower respiratory tract the sophisticated mechanisms of the viral entry and replication process together with the associated host immune responses are evidenced by diverse therapeutic candidates currently undergoing trials ranging from drugs, vaccines, and even the herbal medicines. So this is the pathogenesis of the disease. How does it infect the cells? So here we have a key steps here. We have the virus attaching to the SE2, SE2 receptors, which are in the pneumocytes. And therefore, um, it is uh, mostly affecting the lower uh, part of the, of the respiratory system. And therefore, the binding uh, is taken up by, um, is, uh, is, is aided by clathrin. There's a protein that is called clathrin. Clathrin is a scaffold protein that plays a major role in the formation of coated vesicles. And this is essentially available in the cellular cytoplasm. So we have the virus being engulfed into the cell through what you call clathrin mediated endocytosis. And then we have the viral genome released. And then, which is of course in the positive sense, then we have translation of the viral uh, polymerase uh, protein. Now, in uh, clathrin mediated endocytosis, which is uh, this uh, CME in short, it's a vascular transport event that facilitates the internalization and recycling uh, of receptors engaged in a variety of processes, including signal transduction, uh, nutrient uptake, and synaptic vesicle formation. Now, besides the clathrin-dependent and independent endocytosis of SARS-CoV-2, there is uh, what you call critical proteolytic cleavage of the viral spike protein, which mediates uh, membrane fusion and viral effectivity, infectivity in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, as it aids its entry through the SCE2 receptors. And uh, uh, different studies are postulating that there is actually subsequent downregulation of the SCE2 uh, receptors once the virus is bound. Now, there is uh, or the first stage you have is uh, RNA replication. Remember, this is a positive sense. And therefore, what the, the, the virus does uh, is to generate a negative sense uh, upon which we can transcribe and uh, we can have subgenomic uh, or segmented RNA um, uh, 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 portions, which we can generate the nuclear, I mean, the, 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 the structural proteins, the nuclear cuspid, the spike proteins, the membrane, and the envelope proteins. So the, 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 the genomic, uh, the genomic RNA uh, is responsible for viral replication in it is bare positive sense, uh, negative sense, sorry. And then the subgenomic transcription uh, is only uh, happen, happens when we have the, post, the, negative, the positive sense subgenomic RNA, which is what called the nested transcription. So this uh, structural protein, specifically the, uh, the, the, the spike, the membrane, the envelope, are incorporated into the endoplasmic reticulum. And um, at this point, we have them uh, combined with the nucleocuspid proteins in the cytoplasm uh, into the Golgi apparatus, where we form a vesicle, which vesicle therefore can bud, and then we can have excitosis, release of the virus, the, uh, the mature virus. All right. So I, I, I also came across what you call the cytokine storm, as in my reading. And this is a very common scenario attributed to most of the complications in SARS-CoV-2. So emerging evidence of thromboembolic complications, which uh, 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 represents up to 31% of the critically uh, ill patients who are admitted in the ICU, uh, prompting them to be given uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis has been found out. However, one of the main complications is ARDS, which is acute respiratory syndrome, with subsequent hypoxemic respiratory failure. So this is the most prevalent immunopathological event. Up to 50% of the mortalities have been attributed to this uh, complication in the ICU uh, in severe cases. And this therefore require advanced ventilation, either invasive or non-invasive, and also ECMO, what we call extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. How does a cytokine storm come about? So we have viral replication that triggers uncontrollable destruction of the, system, um, of the, of the pulmonary system, 
uh, through systemic inflammation. And uh, this is because of the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, the most profound cytokine in this case could be interleukins, interleukin-6. And then we have interferons and other chemokines. Now the immune reaction results into a violent attack of the lung parenchyma causing either fibrosis because of the prolonged inflammation or ARDS with multiple organ failure and death. So this, this is a diagram uh, illustrating what happens. So we have talked about the viral entry and the replication uh, just on the left lower corner. And then we also have antigenic presentation. How does the virus, how is it presented to the cellular immune system? And what happens subsequently is what you call the immune response. And this immune response, we can see the interleukin-6, the chemokine, uh, CXCL10, and all those uh, cytokines cause an overwhelming immune damage of the lungs. So, clinical presentation. About 80% of the cases as of now are known to cause mild disease, um, are known to be due to mild disease um, of um, cases worldwide, are known to be mild or asymptomatic to some extent, with a latency period of up to 24 hours. Um, fever presents uh, is the most common symptom in mild patients, 83 to 98%, and this means you can encounter them most of the times in community pharmacies. We have cough, 46 to 82%, which is usually dry cough. Uh, we have shortness of breath or difficulty in breathing, myalgias, and fatigue. About 15% of the cases, according to one data, gives us severe disease, and these ones require hospitalization. And uh, this present with hypoxemia, uh, SPO2 less than 94% on room air, in about more than 50% of the cases by day eight. So by day eight, we expect that most of the case will require hospitalization in, um, due to hypoxemia and therefore requiring oxygen. And then um, we have lung infiltrates in more than 50% within the first two days. This near with 31% and then um, respiratory rate of more than 30, minutes, uh, 30 uh, cycles per minute. Now, those that present to the ICU due to complications are about, about 5% of those who actually have severe disease. And in this case, we have a mean age of about 70 years. Like I said before, these are subject to different uh, settings in Europe, in China. Uh, <coughs> sorry, in China, this, come, uh, this, this differ, and therefore we cannot uh, rely. This even for Africa, it's uh, different. So those with uh, complications present with um, ARDS, like we said before, uh, respiratory distress, sepsis and septic shock, with about 67% of them uh, requiring vasopressors. We also have cardiomyopathies in about 33% of the cases. And this is question, is it due to direct harm of the virus on the, on the, on the cardiac tissue, on the heart, or is it because of secondary inflammatory processes? Um, chest findings reveals bilateral in, uh, involvement. That means both lungs are affected equally. And may, this may be known between the first, uh, the first two days of flu symptoms in a more than 50% of the cases. Uh, what are some of the risk factors for severe disease? Age more than 65%, immunosuppression, either due to uh, immunosuppressive conditions or because of the immunosuppressive medications that someone is taking, uh, uh, COPD, and of course, asthma. Diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, cancer, and obesity. Now, these are the leading risk factors with severe disease. There may be others as well, but these are the most known as of now and the more profound according to studies. Now, COVID-19 and other respiratory tract infections or allergies. Now, many patients come to community pharmacies and many times they are presenting with uh, respiratory symptoms. Let me say someone is coughing, someone is having a lot of rhinitis and therefore, you know, they're having an itchy so, uh, sore throat, you know, and all those symptoms. And um, you may not be able to distinguish between COVID-19 and maybe the common pneumonia or the common flu, common cold and all that. Now, this is not like I've said, not easily uh, easy to dis uh, distinguish from other uh, conditions of the respiratory tract, depending on the clinical presentation. But WHO, WHO interim guidelines recommend confirmation by lab testing, regardless of the clinical or radi uh, radiological symptoms. Um, <clears throat> 
So uh, what happens in COVID-19 as well is that there are increased liver function tests, uh, uh, what I call the uh, transaminases, AST and ALT. It's more elevated, more commonly than in a, in a typical bacterial community for pneumonia case. Um, <clears throat> travel history to COVID-19 risk areas within the last 14 days. Probably if someone went uh, to China in the last 14 days or so, and they came back with such symptoms, you want to think about COVID-19, you know. Uh, priority testing, according to WHO, is given to patients who are hospitalized, those who went to, uh, in hospital, either due to other conditions or because of COVID-19. Uh, chronic medical conditions, people with uh, conditions like diabetes, hypertension, heart failure, uh, and also frontline health workers. Okay, So the recommendations to test all uh, patients presenting with respiratory symptoms are limited by the availability of the SARS-CoV-2 test kits. And that is a general problem across Africa and the world. However, it is important as a community pharmacist to rule out drug allergies and reactions presenting with the respiratory symptoms. People with uh, on beta two uh, beta agonist therapy or ACIs or ARBs will most likely, uh, in some instances, present with uh, side effects that may tend to mimic uh, an RTI. Um, um, in that case, so. <laughs> What are some of the current supportive management strategies? It's important to know that uh, these guidelines that are being developed worldwide across uh, the world by different countries and societies are actually adaptive, uh, these manage, uh, guideline, uh, management guidelines. And this is because the treatment protocols will keep changing based on developing evidence. Okay? So there, is, uh, there are currently no clinical approved antivirals or vaccines to manage COVID-19, although there are emergency approvals, uh, which allow. However, other public health measures to contain the spread of the virus, like the current lockdown in Uganda, and um, uh, have been imposed as uh, concerted efforts to identify therapeutic options are ongoing. Okay. So supportive management remains key, therefore, for individuals at risk or with mild COVID-19 uh, symptoms. Natural cough remedies, uh, which includes honey, lemon, salt water, gargle, and all that, vitamin C and zinc supplements, um, appropriate use of antipyretics, people with fevers of unknown origin, um, standard oxygen therapy, judicious use of fluids in those who are hospitalized, especially in emergency cases, those presenting with signs of shock or sepsis, and empiric broad spectrum antibiotics to cover secondary bacterial infections. Now, MOH um, released uh, comprehensive case management guidelines, and therefore for comprehensive care, we need to refer to them. I think they are on such a situation and we can access them. So, what are some of the trial therapies or therapies under trial worldwide? So I classify this into two, mostly what you call the positive drug trials. Uh, these are agents with proven efficacy in preliminary non-randomized observational studies. However, require studies of high rigor, what I could call the RCTs, to generate quality evidence of efficacy and safety. So we have uh, Remdesiva as an investigational new drug. Uh, which is the most com uh, currently, uh, you know, um, approved um, uh, across countries, I mean, uh, in the U.S. And then we have other drugs which are in um, clinical use already and what you call repurposed drugs which have been approved for other indications. This include hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine, uh, azithromycin, bavipravir. And then we have monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. Sarilumab and tocilumab is the, are the most commonly um, are, the, are the ones under study right now. We also have covalent plasma uh, from patients who have recovered from the viral infection and vaccines, of course. Then we have negative drug trials. Uh, these have no plausible evidence of in vitro activity, or there is, uh, or, or if there is any. Uh, there is no significant clinical experience of use of these medications, and therefore they are not so much um, under study, unlike the positive drug trials. And this include the neuromidase inhibitor, what you call oseltamivir and ribavirin, beta interferons, uh, SEIs and ARPs, of course, 
viral protease inhibitors, lopinia baritonova, corticosteroids, and sides. Okay. Now, <clears throat> lopinia baritonova, of course, it acts on the proteolytic proteins, which we call the CL, uh, 3CL pro and the papain like proteases, uh, proteases, which are involved in the viral replication mechanism, like we saw in the previous slide. And therefore, <laughs> there were studies done on it. Uh, Neuromidase inhibitors, for example, also temavir in influenza. It was used in influenza. Some people um, or some uh, studies tried to uh, find out its efficacy and safety in patients with SARS-CoV-2. However, you have to know that the SARS-CoV-2 pathogenesis differs from that of influenza virus. And therefore, this proved ineffective and uh, it is not under study currently. Um, however, there are also some controversies. Um, in COVID-19 patients, I mean, um, uh, basing on uh, theoretical risks, especially among COVID-19 patients. And this is controversy in terms of the published data and uh, among societies, different professional bodies and governments. For example, NSAIDs that we have put under negative drug trials and steroids. Uh, this can be used in chronic inflammatory conditions. However, based on theoretical evidence, there are some studies that have found that they have uh, that their anti-inflammatory activity may actually dampen the immune system, and therefore prolonging the recovery process. Or they are, can actually stimulate the ACE2 expression among COVID-19 patients, and therefore enhancing disease severity. Or they actually have an effect on the uh, on the RAS system, the renin aldosterone and angiotensin system, especially on the aldosterone, reduction of the aldosterone, which is a key enzyme necessary for salt and water regulation in the body. And this has been um, also attributed to the increased severe respiratory failure in patients with SARS-CoV-2. However, evidence is conflicting and uh, we still have to wait for other uh, sources of information that can be reliable to make decisions. But for now, NSAIDs and steroids, most societies don't recommend. However, paracetamol is being preferred in many cases, in term, in, in maybe in terms of pain or in terms of fever. Okay? These are based on the comments from the European Medicines Agency and also expert opinions from different countries across the world. Uh, we also have SEIs or IRBs, which we have seen under negative drug trials. And these are mostly used in hypertensive and uh, patients with cardiovascular diseases, for example, heart failure, okay? So in this case, uh, a single center study, I remember, which was involving about 362 COVID-19 patients, showed that there was no difference in severity of the disease, uh, complications and risk of death in those who were taking SEIs compared to those not treated with these medications. And therefore, while there is still more um, question on whether these medicines would be viable, uh, we have to wait for further studies. However, most societies recommend patients continue. And then in patients with DM, there have been concerns that diabetes patients actually have an increased expression of the ACE2 receptors. And that's why it's one of the major risk factors. So what I call the IND, access pathways or the investigation new drug access pathways. How can patients access these medications under study? The first is through clinical trials that generates reliable and systematic data regarding the efficacy and the safety of an IND for regulatory approval. And therefore, this is the gold standard uh, um, way of collecting data. Then we have compassionate use, which relates to individual patient use of an IND outside of a clinical trial that is intended to treat a serious or life-threatening condition. And then we have expanded access protocol whereby we have individual patient compassionate uses um, of an IND upon local regulatory approval. For example, FDA and European medicines agencies uh, approved uh, hydroxychloroquine. At this point, these drugs can be used at individual compassionate uh, use programs for these patients with COVID-19. However, you know there are varying regulatory mechanisms in different countries regarding, uh, regarding expanded access to an IND. And therefore, there are variations across uh, regions how patients can access these investigation and drugs. We have multinational mega trials. Now there are mainly two trials because before we go to single trials of each drug per drug and this is the solidarity trial and the discovery trial. So both these studies are, are trials are adaptive in nature in the way they are designed in their protocols. Why? Because as knowledge of the virus keeps evolving the disease pathogenesis and the risk factors are also you know, changing and therefore these trials will be 
um, um, they designed or changed accordingly, depending on the evolving data. And then also both of these trials are currently in mid-March. So the drugs involved in these three, two trials are one, we have Remdesivir, which is a new drug, and others previously under uh, use in other clean conditions, ibuxicloroquine, lopinavir, ritonavir, and beta interferon. These drugs were selected based on reasonable safety and efficacy outcomes in earlier observational studies in China and other European countries. So in particular, the solidarity trial is funded by the WHO and Global Health Partners, and it is running up across the WHO member states uh, with a very simplified protocol for quick and flexible trial execution to enable even overloaded hospitals to participate with no paperwork required. So that means people can use electronic means to submit data and to enroll patients, especially where there are so many uh, admissions in a hospital. And this has been designed to reduce total time by up to 80%. So this is a very large, uh, one, of the, one of the largest actually phase three trials, multi-center trials, which is uh, running until November 2020. WHO is co continuously reviewing other suggested licensed drugs, for example, for, uh, for Vipravir of recent, for inclusion into the trial. Uh, flexible, um, <clears throat> like we said before, they have a flexible uh, protocol, like we said. Now, the discovery trial, those are, that is, it is a registry identification number. It's also a phase three trial, multi center uh, study, with uh, an estimated enrollment of 3,100 at the end of the, tri uh, of the study, or as the target, uh, with patients across the EU countries. However, pregnant uh, women, immunocompressed individuals, and individuals under high risk medications, for example, those who are currently taking Ropinava will be, uh, or HIV patients will be uh, eliminated, I mean, ex ex exempted from the study. And this is uh, funded by the French Institute of Health and Medical Research, and we expect the results to be back by 2021. So in conclusion uh, of these two trials, the WHO solidarity trial is the most, uh, is the most uh, promising trial in terms of the timeline when we shall have uh, its study results back, okay? And that is in uh, <coughs> early. This, uh, this year, Remdesivir, which is uh, from Dillard Science USA. So this is a potential drug candidate, uh, which actually specifically binds to the RDRD, uh, RDRP uh, of the SARS-CoV-2. So this is a pro-drug and just be activated by the body. And we have, therefore, um, other, uh, other targets or targets of uh, our drug targets uh, especially when you look at um, other studies that have found out that the binding pocket in this, um, in this drug to the RDRP, it is a major site where it is, it's the most promising site actually to, against, to work against this virus. And therefore, that's why you see RMD, RMD has uh, got a lot of approval um, across uh, in US and many countries, if they would afford, actually would have uh, uh, accepted it to be used for COVID-19 patients. So studies are ongoing to determine the possible drug version of the viral proofreading mechanism uh, of this very drug. So the, the virus has uh, the exon, which is in position 14, responsible for the non-structural protein formation. And, and therefore, if the drug binds to this, that means it evades it is proofreading mechanism. And therefore, we know that this exonucleus is responsible for maintaining the integrity of the virus. And therefore, if this drug is able to bind to the exon, that means it can easily allow the virus to mutate. And therefore, it can compromise on the viral, viral uh, virulence and also it is able to replicate. However, there is proven high selectivity to the non-structural protein 14 uh, in the already uh, open reading framework 1AB especially at high and non-toxic plasma concentrations. So initially this we know was developed for Ebola in West Africa in 2014. And it had a good safety profile, however low efficacy compared to the monoclonal antibodies, Marble 4 and Reg ED3. Currently there are eight COVID-19 clinical trials uh, that are ongoing. Non-randomized studies uh, conclude that this, uh, COVID, uh, this remdesivir shortens the duration of hospitalization for those patients patients. Uh, however, there is a need for larger studies which we are waiting for. Access to this drug is mainly through compassionate use programs, only limited to pregnant women and uh, under 18 
uh, children with severe disease. Therefore, adults are being moved on to expanded access programs and clinical trials. Remember, we said we need to optimize the use of clinical trials. Um, what are some of the studies we are anticipating to have outcomes soon? Uh, we have here uh, information from Gilead, and we have ones uh, about um, uh, uh, a six trials, seven trials, sorry, which we are anticipating. And the main ones we have said is the INSAM study and the solidarity study from the WHO. Those are the ones at the bottom. And then we have other studies that are being, uh, you know, are ongoing and are recruiting patients. However, the outcomes uh, come at different times, as like we have seen here. We are having uh, one expecting in late April, that is the Gilead Open Label Simple uh, Trial. And therefore, if the outcome, as of now, the outcome is not yet out, uh, is not yet um, provided. However, we are waiting for them to release information on that. So, <clears throat> comparison groups. In this uh, remdesivir studies, we are comparing information of safety in regard to age, comorbidity, and dosage, and then also the duration. So, they are testing is a five-day dose adequate compared to the 10-day dose, or even the disease stage among severe patients and um, uh, critical ill patients. The regimens, 200 milligrams IV on day one, and then 100 milligrams for the rest of the days. People with the elevated liver enzymes, five times the upper limit, are actually being, um, uh, are being excluded from the study, or renal incompetences, or people allergic to cyclodextrin, one of the ingredients of the drug in its formulation, pregnant people, uh, women, low blood pressure individuals, and uh, people who have uh, using lobinavir uh, concomitantly. Sorry. Future prospects by Gilead Sciences, um, they are looking at developing in health and oral formulations of Ramdesiva. Concern, however, is on cost and IV use risk factors, uh, supply issues upon approval, and therefore this may not be a very likely option in low and middle income economies, even with good trial outcomes. Okay, so we are going to hydroxychloroquine. So this reduces expression of um, the, 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 the clathrin protein in effect, and therefore affects the SCE2 glycosylation process. And also it increases the endosomal pH, interfering with the formation of, uh, with the vesicular fusion in non clathrin dependent cellular endocytosis and exocytosis as well. So adult data for treatment and post-exposure prophylaxis is limited and actually preliminary. However, more studies have been focused on treatment rather than post-exposure prophylaxis. It's an off-label indication um, a medication right now for COVID-19. Yet we are to establish the safety and efficacy outcomes of this drug. We have emergency approvals of this, FDA and AMA, who have great compassionate use of the drug. The dosing is as indicated. So, so we have uh, about two sites where we think that this chloroquine works. First of all is in the clathrin-mediated uh, endocytosis at the point of entry. Secondly, is in destabilizing the, for, uh, the formation of vesicles in the cytoplasm. And therefore, if we can't form vesicles, that means we can't have a mature virus being uh, released out of the cells for further infection. And therefore, that is where we think it terminates the activity of the virus. So <clears throat> short-term and low-dose usage uh, of the drug doesn't require renal adjustment, according to expert opinion. And therefore, if considering use also, they just advise that we consider doing baseline ECGs, electrolytes, as uh, renal function and liver function tests. One completed RCT in China uh, showed about 86.7% recovery rate among those who are using hydroxychloroquine. And upon that, many uh, countries went ahead to recommend at least emergency use of a drug. Observational evidence has, uh, however, shows in vitro activity, but low, uh, with low respiratory viral load and quick recovery. So the issue of either uh, uh, viral recover, viral load reduction or viral eradication is based on uh, the addition of another uh, extra drug, which is azithromycin, as shall, we shall discuss in the coming slide. Access, however, is from emergency use, clinical trials, and compassionate use. 
The concerns here is the irrational outpatient dispensing of the drug causing a stroke shortage like we know across the world. And therefore, there is need to control the use of this drug outpatient. And also the increased adverse drug events uh, risks at high trial doses. For example, QT prolongation, hypoglycemia, and hemolysis. So when we add azithromycin to hydroxychloroquine, there has been, um, there has been a, an improved uh, or a better outcome in many countries, I mean, in many studies. And uh, in a French study where we had about 200 COVID-19 patients, there was increased viral elimination on day six post-inclusion. And also there is decreased SARS-CoV-2 shading in six patients if hydroxychloroquine is, combi is combined with azithromycin. And this was from a study that was done by Gottfried et al. However, this was a low evidence and not adequate support clinical use of this combination. What are some of the contraindications of this hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin combination? Pre-existing arrhythmias, heart failure, electrolyte, especially calcium, magnesium, and potassium. Presents, uh, this uh, combination presents a higher risk of adve adverse events, therefore requiring initial assessment for, uh, of benefit risk, uh, and then also close cardiac monitoring of patients who are on this combination and prompt dosage adjustments for drug discontinuation. Covalent plasma. As we have heard, many countries are, are, are preferring to go into the use of covalent plasma. However, studies are still ongoing. This plasma uh, contains uh, virus-specific antibodies that neutralizes the virus upon presentation. Uh, previous studies in SARS-CoV-1 and influenza, which is the swine flu and mass cough outbreaks, showed um, a good outcome with use of this plasma. This presents a low tech, uh, reasonable, and safe treatment option. As the cases, case numbers increase, the pool of survivors increases, uh, provided these individuals have sufficiently high antibody titers, willing and able to donate the plasma. With about 200, 300 mils of the covalent plasma, uh, being used for individuals uh, with severe disease. However, these are from low quality studies. Currently, FDS and EMA have released protocols for use of covalent plasma, especially for severe cases of disease. With eight currently enrolling RCTs, um, and one can access this uh, uh, through uh, uh, clinical trials, expanded access programs, single patient emergency in the uh, IND use. That, um, <clears throat> okay, so, Immunomodulators. Basically, these are mainly interleukin-6 inhibitors, like we said before, that this is the main uh, um, molecule uh, involved in the immune response. So antibodies that modify the innate host um, response, especially in moderate to severely ill patients, um, have been found to be effective, and these are the interleukin-6 inhibitors. Uh, preliminary efficacy data, that means increase, uh, decreased CRP. Uh, which is a, a, a key inflammatory uh, marker. Analysis shows that these inhibitors are effective in late disease stages, unlike antivirals. So we prefer to have these uh, immunomodulators come in later when we have the immune response fully kicked in compared to other stages. Understanding the time lag between cytokine peak levels and onset is important to optimize therapy using this uh, 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 therapy. Different, uh, like we say, different immune modulators are under study. One of them is Sarilumab, which is Kevzera. It was approved in May uh, for, by the FDF for rheumatoid arthritis in adults. However, we are repurposing it for, um, for COVID-19 with a dose uh, 200 to 400 milligrams IV as a single dose uh, currently. And also, these studies, we have also tozicilumab, which is uh, currently studied, and we have other outcomes that have been found, observational studies, currently approved by FDA for rheumatoid arthritis in adults and children at that, uh, as IV single dose. However, we are waiting for other uh, trials ongoing, as shown by this trial registry identification, identification numbers. The clinical, uh, clinical endpoints are patients being a febrile for at least 48 hours, or patient discharge, whichever is closer when you use this intervention. Vaccines, let's look at the principle of herd immunity and social distancing. So currently we have social distancing as one of the major interventions uh, across the world under the, under the lockdown. We also have immunization. So we want to compare from the onset of the infection, how the disease spreads and the end outcome when both of them are actually in play or if none of them is in 
play or if one of them is in play. So with none of them in play, immunization and social distancing, you can see that we have the outcome as being more mortality or increased case fatality rates. And then if you look at, if you only have social distancing, which currently we are doing without immunization, we have reduced mortalities. If you have immunization, which uh, of course we know uh, uh, we, are, we are looking up to uh, the, the outcomes of the trial, of the different trials, we shall have reduced or even no mortalities actually. Most of the uh, vaccine types that are being developed lie under one of the categories ranging from live uh, attenuated to whole inactivated or synthetic peptides or virus-like particles or DNA or RNA vaccines, recombinant subunits and so forth. And as we can see, most of them have different safety profiles and also pose different uh, risks for uh, reactions. So currently there are over 102 or 102 vaccine development projects that are ongoing by major biopharmaceutical and research institutions worldwide with 18 messenger RNA based candidates. This kind of vaccines that we have seen mRNA based candidates present rapid and cheap production and also enhance immunogenicity and good safety profile. The spike proteins or genes being the preferred site in uh, site in SARS and mass vaccine development projects initially, is potentially useful as well in SARS-CoV-2 and therefore other vaccines are targeting the proteins that are, in, I mean the site that encodes proteins of the spike protein. At least there are five subunit vaccines registered currently and uh, this over uh, minimize risk of host immune potentiation. Uh, however, despite less intricate production mechanisms, what we know as life at a whole virus vaccines require extensive safety testing uh, before we can be, it can be rolled into the market. So leading vaccine trials currently, we have uh, mRNA 1273 by Moderna, which is a US company. Then we have uh, a recombinant viral vector uh, vaccine by University of Oxford. Uh, Oxford. Then we have um, an inactivated vaccine um, that is by B and um, by Sinovac Biotech, sorry, and this has these three or these three has pro, have progressed to uh, ahead of others, and they have they are yet to receive FDA approval to start phase two trials. So these are the ones we are looking up to uh, presently. So phase one studies we know in uh, clinical trials are to do with the safety and immunogenicity, and phase two and phase three are to do with the safety and efficacy. Now studies. Uh, safety studies begin uh, being, uh, uh, being the major uh, bottleneck in terms of time will mean that we shall require at least one year before marketing is, uh, uh, you know, a market approval is acquired for any of the vaccines actually. So safety studies are very crucial. So we also know that uh, these studies minimize and decide adverse effects because most of these uh, vaccines are combined with aluminum and therefore we have toxicity issues that come with neurological bone toxicity and also we have inflammatory reactions for example the myofasciitis that many people complain about when young children are immunized okay this leading to fever and other uh, reactions therefore this is time consuming um there are areas that surround these uh, areas of interest that surround these vaccines for example public trust that has, uh, you know, the, 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 the public has to be sensitized. And then also the company's credibility, which are manufacturing these vaccines. And then also um, the vaccine type or its known safety profile, okay? okay? So for example, you compare the mRNA and the subunit vaccines, which one is, has been used for long, which technology has been exported for longer times. And then the supply capacity once this has been approved. So these are some of the vaccine projects worldwide, like we have said. Um, we can see the, 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 the Moderna mRNA vaccine uh, at the bottom of it, nucleic acid vaccines and other vaccines that we have discussed. However, the three, like we discussed before, are the main ones we are looking into. Herbal remedies. So far, Chinese herbal me uh, medicines yielded impressive outcomes uh, in China in the early uh, stages of the uh, outbreak elevating symptoms and improving tissue oxygenation. Uh, there are about two main identified natural lead compounds, 
uh, that, ha that have a high binding affinity to distinct viral protease enzymes and therefore can impede the viral replication. Um, and this is the main two proteins are the three CL pro protease, like we have seen before, and we have the PL pro protein. And therefore, these uh, sinacerin and uh, flavonoids or platicodine D and uh, uh, catechin or we have studied fuel 3 from Cypera Setundas. If studied maybe in Uganda, we can actually have good outcomes uh, in COVID-19 patients. We know about the Madagascar issue where we have someone who came up with, uh, they came up with a, 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 a treatment for COVID-19. Uh, we have known that this is mainly an extract of Artemisia, which we have in Uganda and other uh, Sub-Saharan African countries, and a local plant, what you call Ravinstara. So it's an extract of a combination of one or two uh, plant extracts. And uh, currently they are exporting them to other African countries. This has reported up to about 70% recovery rates. And therefore, this gives us the challenge that we have to have uh, uh, efforts towards having our own trials of the available uh, formulations registered to the NDA or non-registered to see that we can come up with such interventions as well in Uganda. So our perspective is we need to encourage and support COVID-19 research uh, for herbal medicines. Then we have to maximize compassionate use and clinical trial programs for severe ill patients whenever possible. Um, we also have to adhere to guidelines on symptomatic management of patients who present uh, with, uh, with uh, fevers and other symptoms, or even fluid and nutritional requirements for COVID-19 cases as per the guidelines that WHO uh, I mean, um, World Health, I mean, uh, Minister of Health released. So there's also a need to strengthen public and private health sector partnerships in COVID-19 screening. Um, the news from the US is that uh, pharmacies were actually under, uh, on the way to start screening for COVID-19. And if this is embraced, it will increase on the cap uh, capacity of the government to actually, you know, uh, screen for COVID-19 and optimize also so um, the supply and use of PPEs and trial medicines. So if you get the private sector on board, we believe these uh, issues can be dealt with. Therefore, there's also a need in Uganda to align uh, efforts with the global partners and health authorities in vaccine development. What is the way forward? So if we get, um, uh, owing to the mild nature of SARS-CoV-2 and the important role of immunopathology, what we see is that combination therapy is aimed at simultaneously inhibiting viral replication, limiting viral dissemination, and dampening the host immune responses are likely to yield, yield the best results. Like we said before, earlier phase of the disease, antivirals have been found to be more effective. Later phase of the disease, we have uh, the, the, the immunomodulators being more effective. Poor visibility of existing sites, limited infrastructure, and unpredictable clinical trial regulatory timelines among key issues are hindering participation of African countries in most of these trials worldwide. And therefore, Africa is not participating, all that participating in the current ongoing trials. Um, local research on vaccines and herbal alternatives should therefore be encouraged by government. And there's a need for expedited clinical trial design and approval process as exceptional situations call for deviations from traditional approval or regulatory procedures. Thank you very much. Over to you, Kennedy. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much for your you know, presentation. I think a lot of our attendees have found it helpful in you know, getting to understand what COVID-19 is all about. So I have a couple of questions that I'll you know, present to you. I know we are slightly over our time, but I request our attendees just to give us a few more minutes uh, to answer the question. So I'll present the questions in the order in which I receive them. Uh, a number of the attendees are sending their email actually before this webinar. So Pius, Pius is asking if hydroxychloroquine actually cure or eradicate the virus. I know you have on it, but does it really cure or eradicate the virus? That's the first question. Thank you. Hydroxychloroquine. Yes. Does it really cure or eradicate the virus? Okay. So. Um, from, from, from the studies we have seen uh, 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 before, and also from the results we have seen in Uganda, because we have been using hydroxychloroquine in Uganda actually, we have had uh, a good recovery rate, and the question whether hydroxychloroquine uh, either cures or eradicates the virus, it actually cures the infection, um, the COVID-19 uh, disease. 
because we have seen patients discharged and they have actually gone back to their communities, symptoms resolved, and they have done several uh, tests from the lab based using that technique, they are the reverse transcriptase PCR technique, and there are no virus, uh, viral particles available in these patients uh, upon the swabs. So it actually cures and more effective if they use a macrolide, for example, is azithromycin, like we have seen before. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Um, so the next question is um, from Gilbert. Gilbert is asking, you would like to know about the amino acids that uh, make up the coronavirus and its sequence, if possible. Did you have this in your slide, the amino acids that make up the coronavirus? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I, I, I purpose to focus mainly on uh, the, 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 the viral genome of uh, the parts of interest in the viral genome that encode the, uh, the, the, the important proteins, structural or non-structural proteins important for the viral replication, you know. So uh, uh, like we say, we have seen before, from position number one up to position number 16, we have uh, genes that encode different proteins that have different roles. So the main interest here could be the, 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 the gene, uh, the, the specific parts of the genome that encode proteins that will give us targets for drugs, okay? Or uh, because it has a very lengthy uh, genome, most of them, uh, they, they are still doing uh, some studies to find out the role of those parts of the genome. However, what we know as of now is position number three, five, 12 and 14, the roles they play as far as forming the structural proteins and the non-structural proteins and also aiding the viral replication within the cytoplasm of the host cell. So these are the ones I thought you would focus on like we've seen in the screen. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from, um, okay, John Mark is requesting for the presenter to send the, to send the presentation. We'll make arrangement for that. Uh, mm. Then Michael Joaki Modoi, he says he read somewhere about the L strain and S strain of COVID. What is the what? Sorry, pardon me. The L strain and S strain of, of COVID. He's asking what is the difference? Okay. And, and do, you well, have, I, I have, do you have the same strain as in Europe? What is the effect of temperature difference? So the first question is what is the difference between the L and the S strain of COVID? Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. So what happens is that um, I have not particularly come with, um, across that information about the L, L, L and the S strain. However, what I know is that some studies uh, suggest that the strain responsible for the mild, uh, mild presentation and for the severe presentation of a disease are different. However, this has not been shared or, uh, or published, uh, you know, um, uh, in, in, public, in, in journals. So we are still awaiting for if there are very different viral strains or variants yeah, that we are seeing across Europe, Africa, and also di across different climatic uh, you know, uh, regions. If maybe say Sub-Saharan Africa and talk about the desert areas and all that. So, uh, as, so now evidence about mutations or mutated, uh, mutated types of the virus is not clear and it is subject to further you know, studies. Many countries, uh, many uh, uh, bodies, for example, the the African CDC and other, uh, other, other, uh, other groups are doing studies on that to see the effect of climate on the virus. So far, we have information that the virus actually survives, survives most in cold or winter compared to people who are in a, a warm areas. However, this is still ongoing and we have great evidence on that. In cases, anything, I believe we can share after, after we have got uh, good information on that. Okay, thank you. I believe you answered the other part of the question was, that was talking about the temperature. So the next question is from Douglas. He's asking, mm -hmm. are we aware of any, any clinical trial details of the herbal product being promoted by the Madagascar government? And then uh, what lessons can PSU focal team on herbal medicine research uh, on COVID management? So I know you touched a bit of that. Okay, issue. so the first question. Yeah. Mm. So the, the, the Malagasy Institute of, of, of Research in Madagascar, which is the um, facility responsible for that uh, COVID-19 organics uh, uh, product, they, they, they did it in a laboratory. Meanwhile, they have a good uh, reputation of many products they have actually developed, even some of them for diabetes mellitus. And uh, they are well known actually in the region. They have been acquired by the African Union uh, as a center of excellence. However, they, 
the, the, the product for COVID-19 that they are currently exporting to other countries. They based on their observational studies which they have published, I gave you recovery rates of up to 70%, which they are, which are going to their report. So efforts of where these are being, uh, the WHO is accepting all their efforts to see if they can uh, have much better studies, uh, uh, clinical trials, you know, very clear. But they, are, they, they have gone ahead to tra uh, transport to the countries, to export to the countries, so that people can use this uh, formulation. So uh, as of now, I cannot say that they are in a clinical trial, but they have strong uh, their evidence based on observational studies, their patients in their own country. So this is subject also, like we have said before, to clinical trials, and I, I think they should be on their way there. Yeah. The second part of the question, uh, what was it about? Uh, what lessons can the PSU focal team on herbal medicine research on COVID management? I okay. think the question is, what lessons can, uh, can the PSU focal team I learned from this. Yes. Mm. So, the, the, in, as of the PSU, we we can just advocate and also participate in research of uh, herbal medicines for the different uh, uses, for example, in COVID-19. Um, but given the regulatory framework of our country and different countries in Africa and across the world, it, uh, it requires a systematic way of how to adjust your, 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 your study these evidence from animal models and all that. That takes time. So we have said that we need uh, more quicker solutions or ways of how to approve some of these studies. So if we have already registered herbal product, for example, that is on market, and we know it has some activity which resembles what we have seen in COVID-19, you know, uh, the, 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 the organic substance. For example, we have Artemisia annua. Formulations are already available in the market. Can PS go ahead and maybe, you know, most of the pharmacologists, I know there is a team coming to answer this in the next webinar, possibly, but can most of the pharmacologists actually come up and share information about the available alternatives of the herbal medicines? Because this seems to be uh, giving results in other countries like Madagascar. Uganda also could, so should follow suit. Vaccines will take time. Other drug uh, trials will take time, but for this one, we have it available in abundance and people can actually go. So PSU can just embrace the culture that uh, what, what many people are doing like Madagascar and uh, engage in studies uh, use the, uh, for, for, for COVID-19, even as we speak right now, I think it's, it's a possibility they can do that, yeah. Thank you. So I, just, just a quick addition that, so um, the COVID-19 task force under PSU is uh, has, has engaged uh, pharmacognosis. I know Dr. Nyas Ronald and Dr. Stephen Lutochi are working on a paper that, you know, that's looking at some of the herbal products that have the potential for managing COVID. So the next question is also from Michael. Um, so this is, uh, he says from Al Jazeera, WHO has dismissed the cure. However, the herbal contains a Temesia plan. I believe this is related to the Madagascar issue. So he's asking, is a WHO yes themselves having positive results with hydroxychloroquine and dismissing the herbal product. Um, I don't know if you get the question. It's more of, uh, is WHO contradicting themselves? Because they, oh. yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Mm. So, so from, from Madagascar, why they actually went to Admissia Anwar is because their claim was, if hydroxychloroquine actually is working against COVID-19, because they had a first uh, guideline in that country of using chloroquine and azithromycin. So they say if chloroquine or uh, hydroxychloroquine is working against COVID-19, that means that the anti-malaria activity can actually from uh, chloroquine can also be found in the Artemisia, Artemisia plant. So when they did their research, uh, you know, uh, their findings in the lab, they found out that actually it is effective. So WHO, I think it is, uh, it's more about how the system is set. Uh, there is need for, I, I believe the WHO should actually take up these uh, uh, very brilliant ideas and interventions by people across the world. So uh, if we have already evidence from observational studies like we have seen in other drugs, therefore we need to progress clinical trials. So a number of small studies will eventually possibly convince WHO to allow some of the, uh, the clinical trials, but as of now, WHO regards the use of herbal medicines as um, not uh, approved and therefore not considered. However, there should be studies ongoing. So the basis of why they're rejecting could be more on the regulatory aspect. We have not had clinical trials and therefore we cannot tell the whole public that some of these uh, medicines work. However, until they are proven by clinical trials, I believe they will lucky adopt because I have seen about one other clinical trial 
using herbal medicines and it's in a WHO uh, registry, you know, and they're actually ongoing and they're enrolling. So I think they will take it up when there's sufficient observational studies. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So there are a couple of questions that I read to the, you know, the herbal product from the herbal product from Madagascar, and I think you have answered some of them. Gonja asked you mm -hmm. to comment on the herbal product, uh, which you've done already, and then um, is, um, Stephen is asking if there are any non side effects of the Madagascar herbal therapy. Are you aware of any, you know, documented side effects from the the herbal products? Uh, um. So, so from my literature source, I didn't actually get any adverse effect that was reported. All they reported was a cure rate. There is no adverse effect profile given to the, the, the formulation. So I think that it's, it's, it also needs to be reported because it's important in understanding how credible this, uh, uh, credible this product is. You know? So it, it's not reported and I've not come across it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um couple more questions. I hope we can, you know, get done by 4.30. We are uh, over our time. So, uh, Douglas is asking, is the Uganda Means of Health and Uganda Virus Research Institute carrying out any clinical trials on, Uga on Ugandan COVID-19 patients? Are there clean any clinical trials being conducted in Uganda on COVID-19? No, not that any that I know about. Not that any I know about. So, where the, the, the government in Uganda are basing on when they switch on to hydroxychloroquine. I tried to find out if they are basing on on, uh, if they, they actually had done some clinical trials or they are ongoing right now and I didn't find any of them. But their, uh, their basis for approving uh, hydroxychloroquine was mainly based on evidence from other parts of the world that had the virus and they are recommending actually chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So currently, I am not aware about any uh, ongoing clinical trial. Like I said, many African countries are not involved in the clinical trials. And I think this is a culture that needs to be actually uh, worked on. People need to change that attitude. When we are going to have clinical trials, we have a rich, uh, we are rich in biodiversity in terms of the gene pool. And therefore, if we only have studies taken, uh, taking place in Europe and Asia, that means that when the outcomes of these studies are published, we cannot generalize them to Africa. And therefore, there is a need for us to extend and allow clinical trials. So we'll have uh, issues, like I've said before, of finances, issues of not having that, that as they are not having um, uh, centers of excellence that can give uh, a facilitate uh, good quality studies and then uh, not participating in most of these studies, but there's need for us to participate. So currently I'm not aware about any uh, ongoing trial in Uganda. Mm. Okay, thank you. So a very similar question to that Julius is asking, is the recovery of the Ugandan patients attributed to hydroxychloroquine or the immune status? So uh, they, they play, both, uh, both of them play a role, immunity and hydroxychloroquine. But uh, immunity can be regarded as the control group this time. So those who have been received the drug or those who didn't receive the drug, okay? In this case, in Uganda, we didn't record, record any death in Uganda. And therefore, the immunity of our population was really good. Uh, but also, when we had hydroxychloroquine on board, we saw more people being discharged from the hospital due to recover, from recovery. So we can say actually that we attributed that effect mostly to hydroxychloroquine. And of course, the immune system also was in play. Thank you. Um, yeah. so we, we hope to host the, the pharmacies of, of Entebbe Hospital. So hopefully give us more insights on the, you know, on, on the COVID patient at Entebbe Hospital. So uh, Noah, Noah Boda also has a question related to the, you know, the, the Madagascar issue, which I know you you know, you uh, made some comments. It's asking what steps are being taken by the Ugandan what steps are being taken by the scientific community within Uganda and Africa at large to assess the efficacy of the cough organics from Madagascar? I know you have, you know, you have pretty much answered that on, um, on some of the need that should be taken in trying to uh, assess the efficacy of that product in Uganda. I know our farmer sure. will answer that. Um, so, um, uh, well, Silas is, is appreciating your presentation. I then is also um, is inquisitive on how the pharmacy fraternity in Uganda and a PSU is supporting local scientists who may be working to develop anti-COVID drugs or vaccines. Case in point is uh, KI, I mean the Chambo University Biotechnologies. Do you have any comment? Mm -hmm. No, I, I think the, 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 what happens is that PSU is actually doing pretty well, uh, very, very well in terms of the last time I saw the secretary actually issued the information and inviting uh, proposals for members of the society. You know, if you have any proposal for either herbal medicine or for the vaccine 
that you think you can develop, it is okay. So the society is inviting members, if you have an idea, or you have a proposal, please reach the society and uh, through the secretary and let you be part of the team, because we need those right now. I don't know how many people have responded so far to the secretary, but I know he actually is waiting for them, or he's even expecting more people. Secondly, is that many countries across Africa actually are trusting, you know, there's more trust on herbal remedies, especially, uh, among the communities in Africa as compared to the vaccines and all that. So there is an issue right now. So many presidents, uh, for example, the president from Comoros was appreciating the Madagascan president for actually launching and coming out to launch that product. So people uh, trust more on the hub of formulations and on the issue of Uganda when we had the gentleman called Robert. My take is that it is a good thing for people to be innovative, especially in this time. But how they handle their innovation is how they communicate their primary findings. If they are in a, a, a told DNA finding, is also important for them to consider. And secondly, if there's any claim of COVID-19, they have uh, their uh, their well stipulated uh, uh, routes of how to you know go through NDA until you're approved or even given an, um, a first approval by the NDA in case there is uh, you know inactivity. So I think it's a good thing to embrace those people who come up with such innovations. It's not good to bash them and you know to chase them out of the window. However, there's also a way how we should report our findings, our and our proposals, either the society or to NDA and the Uganda Health Committee. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I know you, 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 you hinted a bit on the ethical consideration during research and you emphasized you know, the need to work about Some, Someone was asking what are the ethical consideration during such emergencies? Are there available for some principle of ethics? Can, can, can I, I know they have been trying to fast track uh, some of these trials, but do you know specific waivers that are maybe um, made during such emergencies, during you know, clinical trials? Okay, so uh, what happens is that um, the, <clears throat> the traditional way of how clinical trials are being conducted is time consuming. And the world is aware about that, the scientific community, even the politicians, even is aware that we need a cure as soon as possible. So the, the master protocol for WHO, especially for this solidarity trial, was uh, designed not to be as reflecting the traditional protocol, but to allow people to have uh, to enroll in the study and not to interfere with much of the clinical work in the, in the hospital setting. So what happens is that people are, for example, in that uh, particular trial, people are not, uh, the physicians, first of all, you do things online. If you're the one who's enrolling patients, you do things online. You just have an online platform and your reportings, your findings, your enrollments, or any information you want to, you just feed into the system. It's that quick and that simple. Ideally, you would need actually to be, um, to, to have paperwork, paperwork done, submitted to the NDA, and then you know, to subsequent authorities. So we have waived that part of using paperwork in this case, and also um, the, 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 the patients, I mean the, the patients being enrolled. So there are people who are like pregnant mothers, someone said, how will we make sure that pregnant mothers or those who have chronic conditions are also included in these uh, conditions? Now, you have seen us talk about some studies that we are debating about the effect of diabetes mellitus on the infectivity or the severity of the as COVID-19. And therefore, most of these patients who have COVID-19 and they have uh, as, uh, 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 also diabetes, they are not being excluded. So most of them are being added on. So most of these patients are not being, as long as you're already having uh, diabetes, okay, and you have COVID-19, they don't remove the medications of COVID-19 and uh, diabetes from you, no. You're allowed to progress and then at the end of the day, they do good analysis and report on the findings based on the different co uh, groups of patients with comorbidities, different medications, um, you know, and all that. So, uh, so it is just something where it's a new idea, especially given this kind of pandemic and different uh, strategies are being put in place to make sure this are weakened. So I would think that is, yeah, I think that answers you. Mm. Thank you. So. Uh couple of last questions before we conclude. Uh, Amon is asking, how long can an individual stay asymptomatic, you know, with coronavirus? How long can someone stay asymptomatic? Currently, we know 24 hours. Currently, we know 24 hours. I think, uh, no, 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 um, there have been four hours, yes, asymptomatic. But the uh, uh, incubation period takes up to 14 days. So currently, what has been found out is 24 hours without any symptom at all. Without any symptom at all. Okay, but the period of incubation goes up to 14 days, or even sometimes up to 30 days that has been reported, but averagely between 2 to 14 days as of now. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, for thank people you. who are asking for this uh, recording, we, we shall make uh, we shall uh, make available uh, this webinar. We have been recording it, um, so we'll make it available and hopefully we can also share the presentation. Uh, just a comment from Barbara. Yeah, this is a, just a comment. Is uh, she says one of the key hindrances to vaccine development would be you know the virus uh, the virus mutation. I think that is known. Um, let me see if you have any other questions that we have missed. Um, um, there was a question I'm looking. Someone asked about the sanitizers. I think I'll. Um, There was, a, there was a question of, of you know, of, of this, of this uh, sanitizers being imported from China if they meet the PSU standards. I, I, I know um, that would be the role of India and NBS in, um, in, in assessing the quality of uh, the hand sanitizers uh, that are brought into question. Uh, no, sorry, Enoch. Uh, the, the question about uh, Resistance strains developing. Just let, let me just check that question. Um, so, uh, Enoch, I sorry I missed your question. So, Joshua, the question is uh, regarding Remdesivir. Re re have they ensured that it does not lead to resistance strains of the virus? I mean, during the, you know, the, the design and, you know, development of, of Remdesivir, uh, have they made any, you know, any, any, any design to, to ensure that resistance does not come? Okay. So, um, like we said before, the exoribronuclease, uh, which is in position 14 of the operating framework 1AB, uh, this especially helps the virus to survive, either environmental or, you know, host uh, Im uh, uh, immune system uh, hostilities. However, we are having studies which are going to evaluate if, if the drug actually uh, evades the proofreading mechanism of the virus. That means the virus is viable to mutation. Now, a mutation is either a possible negative mutation uh, to the virus. So if the drug, what has been on right now is the mutation causing the virus to be susceptible to the host or environmental factors. So as regarding to whether this can cause resistance strains, we have said that this has been proven to be selective, the, the remdesivir, okay? It's selective especially to NSP14, uh, I mean uh, NSP12 at high concentrations, non-toxic concentrations. Now, its activity on the, on the, on the, on the exoribonucleus was based on uh, some studies on monkeys and showed that it caused viral mutation. Whether this causes, uh, development of resistance strains or variants of the virus or not is yet to be um, uh, 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 published. So we are waiting for studies. But right now what we focus on is if the drug can actually cause the aversion, can we have the virus ability to protect itself or to survive uh, the host and environmental factors? Can we have it uh, compromised and then we can do away with this virus? So as if it can cause resistance strains, you can wait and see if we can have studies uh, sharing on that. But it's not yet clear. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, thank you, Joshua. I believe those are all the questions. In case we miss your questions, please do send them to editorial at psu.or.ug. So thank you all to our participants for attending this webinar. Please, as you're leaving, please uh, fill our feedback form. There are a number of resources. Um, I, I, I mentioned some guidelines that the task force is developing, but also I know FIP has a number of resources that pharmacy can use and pharmacies. So, so if you go to FIP website, that's fip.org forward slash coronavirus. There are a lot of resources. And FIP also been um, organizing a lot of webinars. So if you want to uh, sort of understand what's happening in other parts of the world, there's been very interesting webinars. For example, there was one uh, that was presented by pharmacies from Wuhan in China. So it was a very enlightening um, discussion. There's a Facebook group uh, that is discussing COVID-19 and pharmacy. You can check it up. Uh, pharmacy and COVID-19, a lot of interesting discussions with, uh, with colleagues all over the world. Uh, so thank you once again for coming for this webinar. We hope you're able to learn something. Please fill our feedback form. We, we are soon announcing our next webinar, so we hope um, you can be able to join us again. Thank you and please stay safe.
Thank you, Joshua, so much. All right, thank you.